Hello and uh, welcome uh, to this uh, CNBC Africa special broadcast where we are focusing on energy in Africa. I'm Godfrey Mutizwa. Now in the next couple of weeks we will be taking a look at energy in Africa and what it will take to make the leap to cleaner energy. In today's session in particular we will focus on financing energy development in Africa and the strategies required to make it work. My two panelists are Rolake Akinkube Filani, Advisory Board Member, Africa Energy Chamber, and Professor Luazi Ngubevana, Director of the African Energy Center at Viz Business School. Thank you, uh, lady and gentlemen, for joining me uh, this, uh, today. Um, my opening thoughts are that uh, after a little bit of uh, desktop research or back of the envelope research, if you like, energy in Africa is expensive. And, of course, we are short of it. We know the statistics show that we are talking about more than 600 million people who are without access to power. So our focus today, as I said, is trying to find the strategies that will enable us to be able to finance the energy that we require while at the same time making the transition to cleaner energy. Tough ask if you ask me. Let me begin with you, Prof. Your opening thoughts in relation to our ability to finance energy in Africa and what will be required for us to be able to do so. Thanks, Patrick. Um, look, I think, you know, Africa, we are in a very fortunate position uh, of, of being allowed uh, with, you know, massive natural resources. Uh, we've got, I think, the human capital um, to make sure that we can provide energy for our people. Um, as you rightly point out, uh, financing has been a big, big, big problem. Um, for me, I feel that a big part of this problem is because our planning um, has always been in silos uh, as, as countries. Uh, we haven't planned uh, on a regional scale, and, and I think this is something that we really need to uh, start moving towards. Um, I think we've got a very beautiful framework uh, in terms of the uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement, and I think it's a very good place to start, um, you know, doing integrated regional planning. Um, and, and I think this will make accessing finance a lot more easy. Yeah. So you are saying we've got the human resources. You're also saying we've got the resources. But I want to remind you of the Grand Inga Dam, a project that we've been talking for more than 20 years. I remember when I was a young journalist writing about that story up to today that has still not come to fruition. What is the problem, Prof? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, I think grading a dam has been spoken about since I was uh, an undergraduate student uh, many, many years ago. Um, look, there, there's been a number of uh, issues. Um, I think one of the key problems we have on the continent uh, is political stability. Um, I think this places a, a great risk to any uh, large projects that we uh, look to embark upon. Um, I think that uh, like I said, the issue of uh, integrated planning uh, is, is a problem. I mean, you look at South Africa. Uh, South Africa has invested lots and lots of money uh, on, on Great Inga, uh, and yet we've got nothing in return. Uh, we can't get the electricity down here. But now, if we, if our planning um, was in line with the you know, planning of the other countries, uh, our neighbors, where we need to get the, uh, the network through um, to get our, our power here, you know, we wouldn't have such a problem. If our planning was integrated with the DRC's planning, um, we wouldn't be in this position. I think that uh, we would have raised the financing that's needed to complete this project. I think we would have built the infrastructure, um, the transmission and distribution lines that we need from there. Absolutely. So I think really it's been that's it, uh, an issue of planning. Yeah, I'm going to go further and say that uh, part of the problem, of course, lies with our uh, politicians and technocrats who have been uh, unable uh, to bring that project to fruition. I remember the SADC power pool being mentioned as the potential uh, solution to all the issues that you are talking about. Let's go west and uh, speak to Rolake. Rolake, I want your opening thoughts in terms of uh, what we need to be able to finance the projects in Africa, but I also want a quick summation of some of the key things that you have seen impeding the ability of uh, that side of the region to be able to produce the power that citizens require. Yeah, thank you. First of all, great to be on the program and great to also meet the prof in, in South Africa. You know, I couldn't agree more. I think political instability has been a key uh, uh, problem for financing. As we know, capital does not like uncertainty. 
there is a huge infrastructure deficit. I think the other challenge we're seeing is the cross-border integration, as he's mentioned, but more importantly, is the ability to find what we call in the finance world bankable opportunities. Now, one of the key hallmarks, particularly of large energy infrastructure projects is that they require long-term capital, long-term sources of financing. And there is greater competition for credit and capital globally. We also see that where the energy sector is concerning, some of the traditional finances of energy infrastructure in Africa have been pulling back in recent years for a variety of reasons. There's the energy transition, a move to net zero, so perhaps fossil fuels have not been as attractive. And it's also really about the ability of the African public sector and African <laughs> governments to provide support on some of these projects. As we know, many energy projects depend on public-private partnerships. And a lot of the systemic risks in some of these sectors are as a result of the lack of political will uh, by African governments to support those projects. However, uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> there is. Intended. There is. And you know, we can talk more about some of the opportunities that we see on the landscape insofar as funding for energy in Africa is concerned. Yeah, you reminded me of one of my favorite phrases in the uh, past years, capital is a coward. And uh, when you threaten it, it runs to where it is uh, uh, welcomed. But I wanted first perhaps to ask a basic question, uh, Rolake. Uh, you are saying uh, the financing that is required is long term. And uh, I suppose we can also add that uh, our capital is what? It's the patient type of capital that is required to be able to finance uh, this infrastructure. So tell me, is it available first? Good question. Let's just put this in context. So if you look at the overall financing requirement for SDG 7, which is universal access to energy, mm. um, the estimate is, I think, from the IEA up to 1.4 trillion annually up until 2030. And as you know, 2030 is just under a decade away. Mm. Um, the other pot of money that we haven't fully tapped into as a continent is pension funds. But if you look at regulation across the continent, most pension funds, I can certainly say in West Africa, Nigeria, for example, are ultra conservative. You know, a lot of these investors focus on risk and return. They're constantly balancing that. So that's a challenge. But I think we can do more to develop domestic capital markets. Uh, there is no doubt there's, an, there's the availability of capital. We need all players to come together, the governments, the development finance institutions. And then we have to see much more innovation in how projects are being positioned. So we need to look more bringing projects in renewable energy with projects in oil and gas, traditional fossil fuels. But the reality is a lot of local banks just lack the depth and capacity to finance. Long term, we're talking 15, 20 years for some infrastructure projects, patient capital, because you don't usually see those returns until many, many years down the line. And in some cases, because a large part of that money is development finance, the focus has to also be on the double bottom line. Right. So it can't always be about returns. It also has to be about social and developmental impact. So these are some of the dynamics we're trying to balance. But yeah. I think there is capital. We just need to be more innovative in tapping into it. Yeah, let's get the uh, prof to weigh in on this one. Uh, prof, is that money available? And also, in terms of uh, the rules that are required to govern uh, that money, are those rules conducive enough? We know, of course, here in South Africa, that conversation has started in, in terms of uh, Regulation 28. And we've started seeing some pension funds beginning to think about uh, financing infrastructure. Thanks. Um, I have to agree with Rolake. I think um, the funding is available. Um, and, and I think the backbone of funding these projects will have to be public-private partnerships. Uh, there's just no two ways about it. Um, I, I think that, uh, as you mentioned rightfully, that uh, the pension funds have now started uh, looking at, at those investments. Um, I, I do think that um, we can mobilize, um, you know, the the pension funds across uh, the continent, and, and not just the private pension funds. Um, you look at the South African situation, uh, we've got a large uh, public pension fund um, that does finance some projects, but I think they, they haven't gone far enough. Uh, and, and we just have to have uh, more appetite for risk on the continent. And, and I think that, um, as Rolak has pointed out, we need to look at the double bottom line. 
in, in, in the sense that in the investments we make, it's not just about the return. Yeah. Um, we need our finance in, in, you know, institutions, whether it be the DFIs um, or, or the private um, bankers, uh, to come on board and, and understand that this is an investment on the continent and its people. Um, it's not just about a return on, on, you know, on, on the investment. And yeah. it has to be patient. Uh, yeah. It really has to be long term. And then yeah. we've shown this, this can happen. You know, we've had massive investments in, in solar projects uh, across the continent. Um, and, and these are, you know, 20, 25 year projects. So yeah. it can be done. Yeah. So, so Rolake mentioned uh, part of the reason why perhaps we're not seeing as much money as we ought to be seeing inside the infrastructure space, uh, which of course uh, includes uh, uh, funding ele electricity uh, generation as we have been talking about. And uh, that's the regulation. I'm asking the question, do we have the right environment to enable the guys who are sitting on top of this money, who by nature have to be conservative because they are, talk they are overseeing money on behalf of uh, 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 people. Do we have the regulations that enable the release of uh, this money so that it is able to do its job? And I want your thoughts on, uh, uh, from, from, from both of you. So, Prof, while I'm with you, let's begin with you. I think there is moves uh, to have the regulation uh, that will allow for a bit more flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, I think, you know, the 2008 financial crisis uh, brought about, uh, I think, a, lo a lot more, um, how can I put it, uh, it brought more, about more regulation, actually, and, and restricted, um, for example, funding requirements uh, for financial institutions. Yeah. And, and this has made things really difficult uh, to access um, you know, funding. So financial institutions now have to ensure that they they are liquid. Um, so their liquidity requir requirements really have uh, have tightened since then, and then this has become a problem. And they're you know more risk averse uh, when it comes to investments. Yeah, you like it. Yeah, I mean, very important question, and and I'll look at it from this approach that some things still happen in Africa despite regulation, <laughs> and some <laughs> things happen because of regulation. And I'll give you, a, I'll give a very practical example. In the last decade or more, one of the things that happened in the local banking sector in Nigeria was a consolidation of banks' balance sheet yes. to build stronger banks that would be able to play more actively in the energy sector. And I think that brought on a lot of change. We saw transformation in the ability to finance projects. But we also see that one of the things that happens with infrastructure projects is that there's certain type of risks that can only be allocated to the public sector. Right. So if you're financing a project in the power sector in Nigeria, for instance, privatization is key. If you don't have a strong collection system downstream or the bulk electricity trader who is running efficiently to offtake bulk electricity from upstream producers, then you have a problem. So we need to ensure that public sector plays its role. But we have also seen some positive moves in the public sector where governments, for instance, have provided sovereign guarantees because of regulatory shortcomings. And I think where regulation does not adequately provide protection, then the onus is on governments to step in yeah. along the value of value chain of those transactions to ensure success for the investor and yeah. to ensure that the consumers on the other end will re receive service delivery, quality service delivery. Yeah. Where should that conversation uh, be taking place, uh, Rolake? Because I'm asking the question, so we've got South Africa with Regulation 28 making moves in that direction, but I haven't heard a regional conversation to say uh, we should be talking together, guys, to build the infrastructure and provide these monies and provide this environment to enable the release of both public as well as mm. private funds. And perhaps should this conversation actually be sitting at the AU level so that we then tie it to the Africa continental free trade area that we're all championing and hailing as a possible panacea to some of our, our, our long-standing problems? Yeah, I mean, I, I quite agree with you, Jeffrey. I think at the AU level, but also at the regional level, I mean, you were yeah. talking about the SAPP, Southern Africa Power Pool. There's a Central Africa Power Pool, there's an East Africa and a West Africa Power Pool. We need to be having those conversations at that, that, that level, particularly for cross-border collaboration. Yeah. But I also think that economic development and growth are different across different African countries. So because they're different national priorities, I think national governments need to also cascade down within their own economy 
economies. Yeah. And that's one of the things we are trying to do at the Africa Energy Chamber to, to develop a multi pronged approach to tackling energy poverty on a continent because we need to harness both renewable energy and fossil fuels yeah. and different regions in Africa have different strengths insofar as these resources are concerned. So I think it's, it's continental, it's regional and it's national. Yeah, I want you to be frank. What are you hearing when you propose those ideas, when you have these conversations? Uh, I'm going to call it national versus regional or perhaps even continental. Well, the reality is we can talk all we want, but yeah. I've always been a firm believer that Africa needs to have a seat at the table. If Africa gets it right, insofar as energy investment is concerned, the reality is we're still part of a global community yeah. that is also talking about climate change. There is a global and broader agenda, mm -hmm. and we need to keep our eyes on the ball. So we all need to come together in one voice to have a seat at the table. For me, that is really what is key, so that we yeah. can influence the agenda that will ultimately impact the continent. Yeah, I was hoping you would tell me that you have been welcomed with open arms, but I will leave you some time to think about that because we I have. think it's <laughs> <laughs> have you? <laughs> because we know part of the problem is our politicians, and unless sometimes there is national interest or even in some cases, unfortunately, personal interest, movement is a little bit slow. Prof, I want you to come in as well and uh, weigh in on this one. Uh, the uh, political will that we require to drive the regional uh, uh, coordination that's required to get this money corralled in. Yeah, um, that's uh, that's always going to be a challenge. Um, as well, like I said, you know, there are uh, individual interests, there's national interests, um, and it really gets very, very difficult um, to get uh, collaboration even within a region. I mean, look at SADC. Um, yeah. Sadek doesn't always speak with one voice. Absolutely. You know? um, and, and, and this is a big, a big, big challenge. Um, I, I think the problem with politics is that politicians have a very short lifespan. Mm -hmm. um, they have, you know, four or five years in office, depending uh, on the country, and, and, and they generally look to their own survival uh, in, in political office. And, and, and I think it's, it's about time that um, that the technocrats uh, yeah. take over yeah. uh, because technocrats can think longer term. Um, their interests are not, you know, uh, narrow interests uh, in terms of uh, ensuring their own survival in the short term. But yes, unfortunately, um, we can't do without the politicians. Yeah. Uh, we <laughs> have to work hand in hand with them. Um, and, and the conversations that, you know, they need to be having, um, I think that... Uh, on some level, there, yeah. there are some conversations, but I, I really don't think we are speaking with one voice. One hundred percent. This is where the problem. I can tell you, I am pissed off, and I'm pissed off because this is a story that I've been following ever since I, I started reporting as a young journalist, and I can tell you that's more than 30 years ago, and it's a conversation that we continue to talk about without any tangible um, improvement uh, on the ground. I mean, you look at our region, there is no leadership from either President Sir Ramaphosa in charge of the largest economy and resources, and also you look at what is going on in Zimbabwe, personal, personal interests all the time, but this is not about me. Let's widen the conversation a little bit. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in Lagos, and we had a seminar. Uh, it was the annual meetings, actually, of the African Finance Corporation. And they spoke about what Rolake spoke about earlier, the need for bankable projects and the people who are able to drive those bankable projects. Prof, do we have those people here in South Africa? We boast that we have some of the most sophisticated banks in the world. Do we have those people here who could be driving these projects across the whole continent, not just in South Africa or Southern Africa? No, we absolutely do. Um, hmm. I, I, don't want to mention individuals, but uh, we absolutely do have uh, the people who can drive these projects. Uh, but again, you know, unfortunately, political interests always overtake um, sure. again. Know, any efforts uh, to make considerable change on the continent. Um, I mean, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's sad. Um, you look, for example, at a slightly different field. You, you look at, at, at transport. You know, we've talked of uh, Trans-Africa Rail for I don't know how long. Yeah. Why can't it happen? There's absolutely no reason other than political interest. Yeah. But so we certainly do have the, you know, the, the, the capital. We certainly do have the, the people who can drive these changes. Yeah. Prof, you referred to it earlier. You said that uh, we need also technical people to be driving this. And I'm going to ask the question, what are you doing about it? 
Well, um, part of what we are trying to do as the African Energy Leadership Center is to develop these leaders. Uh, we're going to be brave. Uh, we're going to take the bull by the horns mm. uh, and drive change across the continent uh, on on energy um, projects. Um, what what we're looking for really is is to grow the next crop. Um, that's going to say this is for the people, this is for the continent. Yeah. Um, it, it's not about politics, it's not about nationalism, um, and, and we are going to make the change. And, and then it starts with very small steps. Yeah, Rolak, I want you to come in as well. This is a free sale. Yeah, well, look, as the Africa Energy Chamber, we're, we're putting our money literally where our mouth is. One of the things we're doing is saying that the energy sector has to be a driver for sustainable economic growth and jobs creation. So we are bringing the Africa Energy Week first of all to Cape Town, South Africa in November. Okay. We're taking a multi-pronged approach where we're bringing together credible businesses, willing governments, emphasis on willing, mm. uh, to, to dialogue and, and drive us growth. And as private sector practitioners, people like myself, are uh, acting as ambassadors and voices in the rooms where these conversations are, are being held. I think we have the capacity to be united. I have to remind you, back in the day of NEPED, the yeah. new economic partnership for Africa development, remember people like Obasanjo and Becky, mm -hmm. there was leadership at the continental level. Yeah. So political will is important in driving economic conversations. It's been done before, and we at the Africa Energy Chamber firmly believe it can be done again. Yeah. How difficult is it to get private money to come into this space? I ask the question because we all know that uh, when, you, in fact, when you look at the uh, prices across the African continent, we have the most expensive power in the world. And we are short of the power, as I was saying, 600 million plus of our people do not have access to power. I wanted to know, before we talk, you know, we've talked about uh, the public money and the difficulty in getting the politicians uh, to enable uh, re the release of some of that money. How difficult is it for, for private money to come into this space? And what do we need to do to enable the flow of private money into that space? You know, the reality is there's this perception that sometimes that Africa is a difficult place to do business. Yes, mm. there is that problem. But look at the amount of private money from Silicon Valley that has poured into the African startup landscape mm. just in the space of the year. We're talking trillions of dollars. So there's no reason why it can be done in energy. One of the very first things to do is provide a stable operating legal and regulatory environment. That's a basic requirement. Mm. The second thing to do is really advocacy. And, and I think the private sector needs to do more of this vis-a-vis -vis government, but also structuring bankable projects and institutional knowledge development. Um, a lot of projects are being financed. You don't hear the good news often. There's the Azura IPP, there are projects, there's the Ivorian refinery again. That brought together uh, development finance institutions, foreign investors, local investors. So these transactions are happening all the time. And yeah. millions of dollars are still pouring into Africa energy and infrastructure projects. But one thing we often hear from investors is having that stability yeah. in your operating environment so that cash flows are predictable, yeah. so that you know that no one is going to move the needle or a change of government is not necessarily going to mean a change of policy. And I think we need to do more work in this regard, particularly as the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement is raising the stakes significantly for a lot of investors. Yeah. Years ago, I think it was 2011 or 2012, we at CNBC Africa uh, organized a debate at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, and we called it de-risking Africa because the perception then was that it was difficult to do business in Africa. But as you say, this has changed over time. Before we started the program, though, uh, with the prof and I were talking about how expensive our electricity is in Africa, and he was saying you can't find statistics that are reliable. So what we do is uh, they take global prices and then add a margin if you like, of <laughs> what it would cost uh, to have uh, that electricity in Africa. And I wanted to talk a little bit about pricing and that risk of uh, producing electricity in Africa. Is it a lot of uh, margin that you have to put, or is it um, something that is manageable, or does it again depend on which corner of Africa you are sitting in? If you are in Ethiopia, for instance, I see here on the figures that I have, you would be among some of the cheaper regions in terms of uh, uh, pricing electricity. But if you are in Chad, Cape Verde, or in did Liberia, you'd be facing a totally different picture. Rolake quickly, and then we come to the prof as we round up.
Yeah, you know, we often say cash is king, but data is king. Unfortunately, a lot of African institutional knowledge is lost because nobody's capturing data mm. around utility prices. The, the one thing I do know is that it, it depends on the country you're in. As you know, electricity prices are still heavily subsidized actually across many African economies. But the cost of supply, certainly from the national grid, has been coming down. Where we're seeing a lot more competition in terms of electricity supplies, competition between traditional fossil fuel sources and alternative energy. And I know, for instance, in markets like Nigeria, solar is becoming much more cost competitive vis-a-vis. -vis. And there are many institutions like the Renewable Energy Associations that are pulling and collating data that will serve both the investment market as well as the public market. So I think institutions are doing a lot more on this. Um, mm -hmm. At a continental level, there's a lot that's being done by the Africa Development Bank yeah. insofar as electricity prices are concerned. But subsidies are still distorting yeah. a lot of the information that we ordinarily have been able to glean from uh, some prof, markets. Very quickly, do we allow the market to uh, decide the price here or do we still uh, d defer to the state and allow a bit of subsidization there and a little bit of market there? Well, I think uh, my view is we, we do need the state. Um, I think we are a developing continent. Uh, we can't simply leave everything to, to the markets. Um, and the market failures, we've seen them uh, elsewhere in the world. So we can't always trust the market to do the right thing. Um, and so I think we do need a bit of state intervention. I think it comes back to what we spoke about earlier, which was we need public-private uh, partnerships uh, in everything that we're doing. Um, it doesn't help us to have a, a state that's in full control uh, because we've seen that can also be quite disastrous, uh, but we certainly do need uh, state intervention. Yeah, and absolutely. And one of our problems, of course, is that in many cases we don't have a capable state that will enable uh, the creation of uh, the systems that are required to allow the private sector to come in and allow that state to be in a uh, best position uh, to effectively manage the space as well. Well, this is a continuing conversation. We have started. Thank you very much uh, to my guests for coming through and they are chatting uh, about this. And thank you, uh, those who have watched this program. If you'd like to contribute, absolutely reach out to us because, as I said, Earlier. This is the start of the conversation and there will be many more uh, to come. From all of us here at CNBC Africa, thank you for watching.